With Disney as Spider-Man's new stepdad, the partnership deal was set for at least five films, three solo Spider-Man movies, and two other MCU features. Sony basically will act as producers and handle the money part of production, while Marvel Studios handles the creative part, such as casting, directing, and writing. Although Sony does have final say on what passes through creative, Disney and Marvel Studios will get 5% of the box office revenue, while Sony gets the other 95% seems a bit unbalanced until you note that Disney also makes all the revenue made from the merchandise. Merchandising! Merchandising! Where the real money from the movie is made! A new laundry list of actors began circling for the new Spider-Man. Nat Wolf, Muscle Butterfield, Timothy Chalamet, Liam James, and then the role would be announced on Marvel's website that Tom Holland was the pick. And here's how Tom said he found out. I basically had been auditioning for about five months. After my final audition, they said, you'll find out tomorrow. Fast forward six weeks, I was still waiting, still waiting, and one day Marvel just posted on their Instagram, go to our website to find out who the new Spider-Man is. And that's it, I just found out online. It didn't, they didn't call me up or anything. And then Kevin Feige finally rang me and said, I've got some great news, you're gonna be Spider-Man. I was like, I know Kevin, you put it on <laughs> yeah. Instagram. This rendition of Spider-Man would once again be taken back to high school, cause you know, that's all Spider-Man has ever been. <clears throat> to be fair, this version of Spider-Man kind of works as a high schooler. The MCU was so flooded with adult superheroes, a teenager was something different in all honesty. Maybe if the Amazing Spider-Man series either had him graduate earlier, or not be an origin story so he could already be an adult. It wouldn't feel as repetitive, but hey, the untold story has to go through the same plot beats as the last series. This version of Spider-Man was going to be 15 years old, and his story would be styled as a coming-of-age type film like John Hughes works, cause that's, you know, literally where they got their inspiration from. Like I mentioned earlier, Spider-Man didn't get a solo movie to introduce him, but instead, more of an extended cameo in Captain America Civil War, directed by Anthony and Joe Russo. This Spider-Man is six months into having his powers, and Uncle Ben is already gone, obviously, cause, you know, he's swinging around and everything. Even with roughly 10 minutes of screen time, Spider-Man was one of the biggest things talked about coming out of the movie. With new life breathed into the franchise, fans were willing to get back on board with the webhead. All right, Spider-Man. Sorry. The name Spider-Man Homecoming was revealed as both a nod to taking place in high school and clearly Disney's way of being cute about how Spider-Man is now able to play with the rest of the Avengers at Marvel Studios. The release date was set for July 2017. Spidey's integration into the ongoing MCU actually changed the lineup quite a bit, though Ragnarok had that July 2017 release schedule, but Marvel probably wants Spider-Man to get the biggest crowd gathered possible, so putting him in the middle of summer was the best bet. This is why Thor Ragnarok got pushed back to November of that year, along with Black Panther, that was moved from November 2017 to February of 2018, just barely two and a half months before Infinity War. Drew Goddard was approached to direct Spider-Man Homecoming, but he'd been working so long on Sinister Six, he didn't feel like starting over on a new project, so he declined. Other people were considered to be in the director's chair. John Francis Daly and Jonathan Goldstein, Jonathan Levine, Ted Melfi, Jason Moore, and Jared Hess, before ultimately going to John Watts. John Francis Daly and Jonathan Goldstein would be brought in as writers though. However, the screenplay wasn't just written by them. It also had the helping of two other writing teams, director John Watts and Christopher Ford, as well as Chris McKenna and Eric Sommers. Casting was revealed with Michael Keaton playing the villain Adrian Toomes, aka The Vulture, third time's the charm, I guess, along with Zendaya as an original character by the name of Michelle. The internet was able to quickly decipher that Michelle was the MCU's version of Mary Jane Watson. Another new thing they add to the series was Spidey's suit. Due to him being Tony Stark's protege, his suit is now equipped with Stark tech, unlike his homemade suits from previous films, even installed with his own AI system, Karen. The minor villains were rumored and shown briefly in the trailers and advertising. Logan Marshall Green and Bo Keem Woodbine both would be playing the Shocker at different points in the film, serving as Vulture's underlings. And Michael Chernus plays Phineas Mason, aka the Tinkerer, Vulture's tech guy. Spider-Man Homecoming made $117 million opening weekend and ended up making a worldwide box office of $880 million. Both a critical and box office success, Marvel and Sony kept the deal strong and got to work on the sequel immediately. Even though he plays a minor role in Infinity War and Endgame, the conclusions of those films heavily influenced the plot of his solo sequel. The director and main cast from Homecoming returned for the sequel titled Far From Home. One change in the writing department was instead of three groups of two writers, only Chris McKenna and Eric Sommers were brought on to write the script. After 15 years of missing his opportunity, Jake Gyllenhaal would get his chance to be in a Spider-Man film, this time playing Mysterio. Besides trying to keep the story itself a secret, other marketing issues arose. With the film having a release date of July 2nd, 2019, this is barely two months after Avengers Endgame launched to theaters. 
Like I said, the last two Avenger films heavily influenced the plot of Far From Home. Spider-Man and half the Avengers get dusted at the end of Infinity War, then brought back at the end of Endgame. The resurrection of the fallen Avengers was meant to be a surprise, so the Far From Home's marketing trouble became, how do we make a trailer for a movie that doesn't give any way huge spoilers to a movie that isn't out yet? This caused debates over when to release a trailer. You either don't have a trailer until the movie's just about to come out, or spoil that Peter Parker is alive again. Eventually, the first trailer was uploaded on January 15th, 2019. The advertising was clever in that no clips reference anything from either Infinity War or Endgame to create an ambiguous timeline from when the film is supposed to take place, even CGIing him wearing the Homecoming suit even though he wears the Iron Spider suit in the movie, since he doesn't get the upgrade until Infinity War. Once Endgame was in theaters, days later, Marvel and Sony upload the second Far From Home trailer. This one included a spoiler warning stinger with Tom Holland. This trailer then confirms that this film does indeed take place after the events of Endgame in 2023, with Tony's death playing a huge role in the plot. The film released in the theaters in July and ended up making $1.13 billion, surpassing not only 2012 Skyfall as Sony's highest grossing film ever, but also as the highest grossing Spider-Man film to date. A marketing strategy I'm sure the studios were aware of, articles began circulating that Sony was threatening if this movie didn't break $1 billion, they'd pull out of their deal with Disney, now that Venom had shown how successful they could be, whether this is actually true or not, I'm sure this convinced some Marvel fans to watch the film more than they originally planned to. With the rumored box office goal reached, a third movie was getting ready to be put into works, but, of course, complications found their way once again. In August of 2019, word came out that the deal with Disney and Sony had been broken off and Spider-Man was leaving the MCU. What the Immediately, people took to social media to cry injustice and figure out what little details there were. Both studios stayed fairly quiet about the situation this time, Sony only stating that Kevin Feige had become too busy with all the new Marvel Studios projects, making Sony hesitant with working with Disney if he couldn't be involved. Fans across the globe started a petition to have Sony either make a new deal with Disney or sell the rights back in full. Hashtags like Save Spider-Man and Cancel Sony were trending on Twitter and memes upon memes were made. This, ironically, undermined the entire situation. Fans getting involved isn't inherently bad. It's nice to let people feel like they're contributing to a project they really enjoy. The problem kind of comes in, though, with people's emotions towards Sony at the time. People were still iffy on if Sony really could make their own Spider-Man movies again, and the fact that Disney made two really decent ones back-to-back, -back, fans were willing to do anything it took to make sure everything stayed how they liked it whether they knew the real situation or not. It doesn't help that both studios were staying fairly quiet about everything, so that caused everyone else to just make this narrative that helped them reason what they had to do. This caused everyone to rush and blame Sony, and then over time realize they kind of jumped the gun. See? Now we're both profiting. How so? Well, if we both make 50%, that's as bad as even as it gets, right? But you still want the merchandise revenue. Yep. And you still want us to be paying for most of the movie ourselves. Uh, yeah, huh? So we'd be putting in more money for the project and you'd get more than us. Yes, um. And you don't see why we don't like that idea? Well, we wouldn't mind just taking 100% of the box office revenue and then you guys just become a subsidiary of us and then everything you've ever made or ever will make will just, you know, make us money. But let's not get crazy. Unless... No! You're being so unreasonable! Sir? We just bought 20th Century Fox, just like you said. Sustenance! Bring me more! Now the tide began to shift to Sony's side. Now that people had information, but they actually kind of knew what was happening behind the scenes. Within a month of Spider-Man's departure from the MCU, Sony and Disney ended up making amends, at least making a deal for one more solo Spider-Man film and one more MCU film. However, nothing's been said if the payment has been changed from the original 5% and 95%. The way this all played out had a few people speculating, however. Some said it was just a way for Sony and Disney to kind of make this franchise more relevant in the eyes of, like, everybody around. I don't think this is true, however, because Far From Home was still in theaters at the time and wasn't even out on DVD. Why would you want to create buzz for a movie that's already made a billion dollars and is still active? Wouldn't you want to wait until, like, you're kind of in between movies when there's not a lot going on with the franchise? It just seems like a weird time to play that card. And with that, now we wait until the third installment of Spider-Man's MCU trilogy comes out and see what other movie in the franchise he pops up in, possibly in New Avengers or something like that. 
Well, I hope you all enjoyed this video, and I plan on doing more videos like this whenever I have the time. I'm glad I finally got to cover all of the Spider-Man movies. Every single one. None missing. So, bye. I'm just fucking with you. Of course I'm going to talk about Into the Spider-Verse. Back in 2014, when Sony's emails were hacked and leaked, information about an animated Spider-Man film were in talks and wanted to get Phil Lord and Chris Miller to write it after the success of the Lego movie earlier that year. At CinemaCon 2015, Sony Pictures chairman Tom Rothman announced that an animated Spider-Man film would be released on July 20th, 2018. Lord and Miller were confirmed as being attached to the project, although it was originally stated that the animated movie would exist in the same universe as the future live-action Spider-Man that would appear in the MCU, later it was said that the project would be its own continuity. The movie was later pushed back to December 14th, 2018. The film was talked about how they were going to try to make it as different as possible to past Spider-Man film experiences, and Sony would confirm that the movie would center around Miles Morales, who had become Spider-Man in the Ultimate Marvel Comics universe back in 2011 following the Peter Parker's death in the Ultimate continuity. Lord and Miller also confirmed that not only would Miles Morales and Peter Parker appear in the film, but multiple other versions of Spider-Man across different comics throughout the years. Sony then assigned three different people to direct the movie, Peter Ramsey, dubbed the action guy, Rodney Rothman, the comedy guy, and Bob Persichetti, the poet. Lord and Miller both would be producers of the film, but only Phil Lord would be writing the story and later screenplay with Rodney Rothman. Shameik Moore was cast as Miles Morales and Lee Schreiber as the main villain Kingpin. Later on, more spider people would be announced. Haley Steinfeld, Nicolas Cage, John Mulaney, and Kimiko Glenn star as Spider-Gwen, Spider-Man Noir, Spider-Ham, and Penny Parker respectively. An adult Peter Parker was in mind to be the mentor of Miles in the film. Tobey Maguire was possibly considered to be asked to reprise his role, but to not confuse the audiences, they went with the original voices. Chris Pine to play the Spider-Man in Miles' universe, and Jake Johnson to play the Spider-Man that would become Morales' teacher after being transferred out of his original universe. The biggest thing that Into the Spider-Verse has to make it stand out is clearly its animation. The film went completely different in ways of how animated films are typically made. For one, the animation team was noticeably larger than average, with 177 animators nearly double the norm. Frozen 2, as an example, had 75 animators. But I guess it would require that many animators, because it took two people a whole year just to get 10 seconds that they actually liked. The art style is heavily inspired by comics themselves. Even so far, the idea is that the film can be paused at any point and it looks like a panel from a comic book. Look. I would love to keep talking about this stuff, but I'm not animation master by any means. And on top of that, this video is already pretty far in. So if you want to know more, go buy the Blu-ray right there. Go buy it. Uh, we need to support more movies like this and go look up the behind the scenes and like people who worked on the film. There's a lot of interesting stuff that goes into like how they animate each character separately and just the ideas behind everything. So please go do that. We need to support these kind of movies. So let's wrap up this video with talking about money and the future of the franchise. Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse came to theaters and ended up bringing Sony $375 million. I will say this is pretty unfortunate due to how awesome the film is and now it's the lowest grossing Spider-Man film, but it still turned a profit and critical response was overwhelmingly positive. Don't feel too bad though for the filmmakers, because this became the second Spider-Man film to win an Oscar. Spider-Man 2 winning for Best Visual Effects at the 77th Academy Awards, and now Into the Spider-Verse winning Best Animated Feature at the 91st Academy Awards. And not only does it have an Oscar to brag about, but Sony announced that a sequel is in production and will be here October 7th, 2022. So there you have it, Spider-Man's history in film. Having a really stop and go start, then just a studio constantly getting in its own way and underestimating their audience's patience and trust multiple attempts to save a possible dying series, and a separation that got way more people involved than planned. It's messy to say the least, but hey, that's showbiz, baby. I think we can rest easy for a couple more years and see what the future holds for our friendly neighborhood Spider-Man. I'm sure Sony is learning a lot from setting up its franchises and making real effort into giving us what's best. There's gonna be carnage. Got tired of doing the whole good guy thing, huh? What's up, Doc? Well, shit. <laughs>